Thanks for being here. Let's hope we, we won't have any more um, sound problems. Um, yeah, so um, uh, I, I, I'm going to try to, to give a talk, which is uh, slightly at a broader uh, level that I usually do at, uh, which is, you know, about the relationship between, between technology and, and society. And uh, really the reason I'm, I'm interested in this these days is that uh, science and technology change society. I don't how many of you have seen the Oppenheimer movie? Uh, it's like half of the room. Well, I thought it was really good, actually. And I, I, I actually could relate a lot to this movie, not that I, I claim I'm anywhere close to Oppenheimer, but the different sections of mo the movie, including the end, which is basically an administrative fight, uh, <laughs> Are very close to, to some things I, I see. Anyhow, you know, if we think about about uh, about science, and you know, we can think about basic science. Uh, we think, for instance, about about Newton. Newton was interested in things such as planetary movement, but these days, Newtonian mechanics is what we use to build buildings and, and bridges. So we can think about quantum mechanics. Well, as we know, it was it was used to 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 do a, a nuclear. Uh, energy and, and, and the bomb, uh, we can think about more, uh, maybe more detached things such as cognitive uh, uh, psychology, where they're not detached at all. Uh, uh, progress in cognitive psychology can help do better education. So there's a really a, a back and forth between, between science and, and society. Uh, and so one thing I, I, I learned uh, quite early is that one of the things I do best is, is coding for, for the better or the worse. And, you know, maybe a few other people in the room uh, uh, like coding. I also realized that I tend to prefer talking to computers than to people. And, and so, you know, I invested a bit in, in coding. And there's one thing about coding is that it's really amazing because it enables even a nobody to create. As long as you have a computer, not everybody in the world has a computer, but in our rich societies, there are many computers. And I, I think this is important because I, I was talking to people yesterday and a bunch of people didn't study computing. You know, they walked into computing by chance. And so did I, actually, I studied physics. And so really, you know, computing is nice because once you have a computer, you can create things and then you can start maybe have an impact on the world. So early on, I became quite passionate about open source. And one of the reasons is that open source opens knowledge. And I was very interested in science. And I thought, well, this is going to help democratize science. It's going to help facilitate teaching. Ideally, reach developing countries. So if we do open source, we're, we'll get you know, more science in the world and hopefully better science. And one thing about software that's very different than many other goods is that software does not, the economy of software does not rely on scarcity. Sharing software is pretty much free in, in the time of internet these times. And as we'll see, it may even reduce costs. So open source comes with the promise of basically cheaper software. And I, I, I really do believe this is true, by the way. I still believe this is true. And so, you know, early on, I, I thought, well, I'm going to create software and do a better world. <laughs> so I'll talk first about my experience in, in helping to grow the, the Python stack. And this is going to be a bit high level. I'm not, I'm not going to go too much into the technical details. I'm happy having technical discussions uh, after if you want. And then I'll talk a bit about... Uh, the relationship uh, between this and, and societal impact. So how many of you use Python as your core tool? That's, maybe I should have asked the question the other way around. Okay, so, so, you know, that's interesting because 20 years ago, that was certainly not the case. It's also my feeling, by the way. My feeling is that it's a major absolutely major tool, but 20 years ago, it wasn't the case. 20 years ago, in my world, what was cool was Matlab. And sometimes Fortran, and sometimes C++. And in, in 20 years, many, many things changed. Uh, so it's really hard to get numbers 
Uh, my feeling in, is indeed that Python is used in many places, not everywhere, to be honest, but it's changing. Uh, the, the corresponding papers have been cited a huge amount of time, and this is important because this is one of the ways we display to uh, other people outside that, that were being used a lot. And what's important is that this ecosystem is, is free, free to anyone. It's open source, you can grab the code, you can read it, you can modify it, you can contribute back. And it's mostly made by a community and mostly volunteers. So people distributed in the world, basically getting together by their own will and creating this thing. So how did this happen? Well, in my experience, there's a lot of personal involvement. Online, you know, it started by mailing lists. These days it's other tools, conferences, sprints. I personally got involved in this, in this world. Well, probably first because the developers were very friendly. I was a, a, a physics grad student and the, the central people building the tools we're just interested in, in, in talking and welcoming uh, people like Fernando Perez, who is uh, behind um, IPython, which turned into, into Jupyter, or Prabhu Ramachandran, who is behind Mayavi. I'll talk a bit about Mayavi. They basically reached out. And what happened is that I was getting more positive feedback uh, working on open source than doing my, my day job, physics, as a grad student. And so you know, it creates a, a somewhat of a, a feedback loop. Interesting thing is that I'm now a supervisor and thinking I'm making the same mistake and not giving enough positive feedback, for instance, because I'm running around giving talks at conferences. <laughs> okay, so that created an impression of being useful, of, of making a positive change. Uh, it, I had more the impression of making a positive change when I was doing software than when, when I was doing physics. And I was passionate about physics. And so progressively, you know, I, I grew in skills, I, I learned software engineering, I learned coding, I grew in confidence. And that, by the way, is the story of many, many people. Many people come in because the community is welcoming and their, their skills grow. And I say the community is welcoming. As we've gotten bigger, we've gotten less welcoming. And it's unfortunately because we've gotten more technical, we've gotten more busy. Uh, I'm, I'm really terrible at replying uh, to email, but we try. So let me talk a bit about some of the adventures I was involved in and, and some of the lessons that, that, uh, that we learned. And I'll start with Mayavi. Mayavi uh, is a 3D visualization uh, package in, in Python. And it was the first major package I got involved in. It was uh, uh, created and maintained by Prabhu Ramachandran, who is a, a professor of aeronautics at IIT Mumbai. And I basically became involved uh, by internet. I remember my first uh, Skype meeting with Prabhu. I was very scared. So why, why, why was Mayavi successful? Well, Probably because it, it enabled very powerful visualization. It builds on, on VTK, the visualization toolkit. So VTK is a very advanced C++ library that uh, was developed for things such as computational fluid dynamics and enables incredibly rich uh, scientific visualization. And so what we did was take the power of VTK and make it easily accessible. And one of the ways that we did this was that we, we attached UI components to every single object of VTK. And there was a bit of a technical things behind this, uh, a lot of meter programming uh, uh, using uh, a library called, called traits. Anyhow, so we had all those, those UI components and that facilitated uh, people, you know, digging in the properties of the objects and, and adjusting those properties. But what was really important was that we focused on simplify, simplifying scripting. So VTK had actually a, a Python um, binding, but it was horrible. It looked like you were 
coding C++ in Python. It was just a direct mapping. And so one of the things that, that we did is that we used the, the reflexivity between the, uh, the UI and the object API to make it easy for people to understand the object API. We even had a record button where you would uh, modify, well, as far as I know, this still runs, by the way. I, I say this, uh, uh, I'm using the past tense, but it's because I'm no longer involved in the project. Anyhow, we, 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 we had a, um, a record button, you would click record and then you would modify things on the UI and it would generate the lines of code. It would uh, print the lines of code. And here the important thing is that maybe the line of code generation was imperfect. I'm not a hundred percent sure that you could always save the script and rerun it, but it was um, a teaching device. You know, you would see those lines of code and you would copy paste them. So there was really, you know, mirroring between the graphical user interface and the code. And another important thing that we did was that we used NumPy, NumPy arrays as data structures. And this was, this was a bit of a breaking point compared to VTK because VTK had very advanced data structures. And they make sense when you understand what you're doing. These data structures make sense, but they were really hard to use for people because they it required uh, people to map their data to the data structure. So we, you know, made a lot of little utilities that made it easy to map the data that people had to the data structures. So really, very simple lines of code. Now, the limiting factors were that we were using VTK. And so the complexity just came back. We had a very complex and object-oriented code base. And uh, I plead guilty for this. Uh, it was complex because we relied on VTK, but it was also complex because we used a lot of object-oriented programming patterns. We had factories, adapters, we used composition, a lot of composition. We had all, all the patterns in the book. And this just made, made the code base very hard to understand for somebody who wasn't an expert in the code base. Add to this the fact that the users of the graphical user interface tend not to turn into developers. So we didn't really, you know, pick up developers as we went. And in terms of users, uh, the initial API was very simple to use, but below the surface, you would quickly hit the complexity of the object-oriented uh, uh, design. So if you, if you wanted to do advanced feature, you basically had to understand uh, rich uh, object-oriented uh, programming. So design patterns in a way, but also the inheritance structure of VTK. And the inheritance structure of VTK is very complicated. And my experience is that it's just hard to learn a complicated inheritance structure. So really what made us was the simple API and what killed us was the complex internal. And at the end of the day, really one of the problems is that Mayavi had only two core devs, and now I think it only has one core dev, poor Prabhu. And, you know, maintaining a package uh, creates a lot of volume. The, the amount of email uh, that I wrote here was the amount of email I had in 2014 on those packages. And there has been an explosion of usage on those packages. And I just don't, I delete the, this kind of email immediately these days. I don't read it. But the thing is that people, expect support. And that's also part of a, a package that's alive. A package that's live is a package where there's a dialogue between the user and the developers, because then it can, it can evolve, it can adapt to, to the re new realities of the world, whatever they are. It can uh, adapt to new technology. If, if there is no dialogue, as far as I'm concerned, the package is not very long. And so to maintain the dialogue, you need several developers. So one thing I learned really is that code maintenance is just too expensive to do alone, plus it's less fun. So that I basically learned the importance of community. Okay, so let's talk about another uh, a software package, uh, Scikit-learn, which uh, does machine learning in Python. I'll define what machine learning is. Now, scikit-learn is a package I, I contributed to, to start 
And it, it has had a, a huge success. It's uh, whatever people may claim, I do believe it's the number one pack, machine learning package in, in the world. Everybody claims this for their own package, but I can, I can back this. It has, it's hard to estimate, but it has millions of recurrent users. It's just the volume of this thing is crazy. We, we got lucky, right? We, we came out at the right time and there was an explosion of machine learning. And so basically we grew with machine learning. We, in no way did we expect to, to create something that big. Yet we created this trying to do things right from the start. And I think this was important. So what, what is machine learning? Who, who uses a bit of machine learning in the room? That's one third, I, I believe. So machine learning is about learning rules from the data. And you can see it as, as fitting data or separating clouds of points. In a sense, it's really computational statistics on steroids. And I, I personally do not like making uh, the position between statistics and machine learning. It's a personal uh, uh, view on this. Machine learning is useful absolutely everywhere. I got into this uh, for scientific purposes. It's basically fancy data analysis. It's at the heart of the modern uh, artificial intelligence revolution. And it's used in every application. It's used in retail, it's used in health. It's used a bit these days in, in weather forecasts, though not, not very much. It's an interesting uh, 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 um, scientific story behind this because weather forecast is, is built on really very good uh, simulations. And then the question is, how do you get statistics in there? It's, it's difficult. Anyhow, the, the, the challenge with machine learning, especially 10 years ago, is that it's basically applied math. And mathematicians like to pretend they're clever. And so I do, I'm a mathematician. And so they don't always tell things as simple as they could. And I guess this is where we came in. I remember one of the initial motivation was to take one of those really good textbooks of machine learning and then turn them into easy to use code. That was one of the uh, uh, earlier motivations. So really the, the vision underlying uh, scikit-learn is really to make machine learning available for everyone. I came from physics and I wanted to make it available for physicists, but the goal was really to target non-specialists. And the challenge here is that we're building on complex algorithms and on statistical expertise. Uh, but these days, my viewpoint is that the first roadblock to have an impact is adoption. So if you're talking machine learning, the first challenge is to get machine learning in an application. And then after you can do fancy things, but first bring it to users. And so we put a lot of effort in facilitating, which means lowering the costs everywhere and going to new applications. And for this, we really leverage the, the Python ecosystem. Something that's quite important is that we do not sit in a vacuum. We are scikit-learn because there is scipy, matplotlib, numpy, python. And that's a very important part of the vision that is not so sometimes understood by, by the higher ups that sit in governments or C-level executives. So the, the core idea of, uh, of uh, scikit-learn is to encapsulate. Uh, we have a, what I call a, an open block box or open black box model where you can use our objects without knowing their internals. I often claim all you need to know is fit and predict. You fit on data where you're trying to learn the link between X and Y. And once you've learned the link between X and Y, you predict and you know that predicts Y given X. There's no need to understand the, inter the internals. I'm not even telling you what algorithm this is. The goal here is, is really to democratize, but one of the side effects is that the models are interchangeable. And as the models are interchangeable, it really helps 
software engineering. It, it really makes a tool that is easier to use, easier to experiment with, easier to put in production. Maybe there are difficulties here. What I'm not showing in this code example is that you can actually access some of the internals via parameters of the objects. So this is why I'm calling this an open box model, where in no way are we trying to hide the internals, we're rather trying to make them easily accessible, which means we're, I'm fighting uh, sophisticated object oriented design in, in scikit-learn uh, with the goal of making it easier for people to introspect uh, the models. One detail of this API, which is really important, is that each step that I'm showing here actually separates the operations. Each step isolates. And an important point is that when we initialize the objects, we fully configure them. Object initialization is here configuration. We're giving all the information needed to configure the objects. And after the object is configured, we can move it around. We can pass it around to a cluster and we can apply it to data. So that detail is crucial. So we, we have a tension is that we can't provide simple objects to target all the use cases. So we push for user implemented objects, you know, Python, is a, is a Turing complete language. It's incredibly expressive. So part of the vision is that people will write imperative lines of code. People may design their own subclasses of the objects, which means that our API, which is the contract that we have with a, one of our subclasses, must stay simple. And here we have a tension because there are always corner cases or advanced usage. And those corner cases may be important. We may want to track sample data, metadata, and that may be important to ensure things like fairness and a prediction. And here, we really, we, we, we have attention and we're busy designing a, a, a rich API that's only opt-in. And uh, it's difficult. I'm not convinced. Uh, uh, we're always finding the right trade-offs here, but the important thing is that we're trying to keep the simple use cases simple. It's the complex use cases that we're struggling with. And once again, we're really not trying to be a framework. I, I hate this word. So making easy is hard. That's one thing we learned. There are a lot of technical choices that go behind this. We need to take models that have less than opposite terms, we need to work on stable algorithms. I'm not going to, to describe this, but there is a lot of work, which is more of the applied math aspect, which is to have algorithms that, that behave well on average, that tend to converge well, which sometimes means choosing algorithms that are slightly suboptimal. We need to choose good defaults, and that's a, a, a very hard problem. And uh, we were a bit sloppy in the beginning. We, we chose some defaults that were somewhat suboptimal. And these days, we're spending more time um, working on our defaults. We strive for usability, and that means we strive for having code that helps users write good code. So the choices that we make are choices that are there to guide good practices in, in users. And we invest hugely on documentation. It's just an ongoing process all the time. We always design the code and the documentations jointly. And one thing that we've done recently is that we, we did a, a MOOC, an online course, and, and our goal here was to target everyone, target people who didn't know uh, uh, machine learning at all from the start. There was a, a tension because we wanted to, to get people to be um, a competent users of machine learning, but we uh, start with people not knowing anything about machine learning. The MOOC is every, as everything we do is freely available. The material is, is open source. Uh, the videos are reusable. The exercises can be reused if you teach a class. I, I reuse the MOOC to teach classes. Okay, so behind scikit-learn, 
there's really a big community and that's crucial. We, we have something like 2000 people who contributed something to the code. We have 20 active core developers, on average 50 people commit a reasonable contribution, more than a, ty a typo fix per month. And they're not always the same 50 people. And those people are spread between academia, startup, we might have a bit of big tech. Across the world, we do have a hub in, in Paris because uh, uh, my institution in RIA has been quite active in, in fostering the community and uh, paying people. The benefit of such a broad community is that it grows in perspective. So you get people from different backgrounds that come and work uh, with you. It's hard, you know, you don't understand each other, but what they contribute is different from what you would have done. And this, this back and forth makes a much better uh, uh, software. And I believe this is true of uh, most of the core libraries of the Python ecosystem. They have been built as uh, shared objects and building them as shared objects makes much, much better tools. It's just crucial. It, it, it avoids the monoculture, it avoids the single application. Now with such a dynamic, we get organic growth. And that's a challenge. Not, not everything can be organic. And so we do have bigger projects that are uh, that have a dynamics that's slightly different that are mostly done by people who are paid full time on the project. And then there is a, a back and forth uh, uh, between volunteer work and full time developers. And when we try very hard to uh, facilitate this uh, this dialogue between the volunteers and and uh, and the full time developers, and we do know that that you know the dynamics of a volunteer is not that of a, of a full time uh, a developer. So I really believe that that this community driven development was crucial to to scikit learn, but it required organizing people. We've grown like crazy. And uh, remember I said that I prefer talking to computers than to people? Well, you know, I kind of learned that I had to talk to people. <laughs> so one thing that, that I was, one thing that we've learned is that communication is crucial, communication across the team. And I, I'm like, I'm one who doesn't communicate much. And so we've really learned to organize communication. Nobody has the, has the full big picture. And so we need to have communication across the team in many different ways. There's no, no single channel suffices. You need all kinds of different channels. And communication is hard, by the way. People will fail. People will fail because they will miss information. People will fail because they will use the wrong tone or misinterpret the tone. The first thing is that you need to accept it's fine. You need to invest in it. And you need just to keep investing in it because it's just hard. The, the good thing about this communication is that it builds alignment. Uh, just, you know, people, people get to uh, uh, agree on things. Recognition is crucial. Uh, early on, we were careful to broadcast the names of uh, volunteers. Uh, more recently, we've built uh, clear cut teams with uh, clear cut roles, uh, and, and we've defined norms and promotion. And an important aspect is, is decision making in, in the project. And decision making is above all by dialogue. It's not by hierarchy. It's very different from, from many more industrial projects. And one thing I've learned that I've personally learned is that accepting others and accepting the choices of others is more important than being right. And that was something hard for me to learn. <laughs> but it, in a sense, it taught me, it really taught me democracy. Uh, discussion and convincing is what builds a group. It's absolutely crucial. Okay, so I could talk about the ongoing efforts. We have a lot of things going on. I'm not going to go too much in details. Uh, we're working on performance. Uh, uh, recently, we got a 10x a speed up in nearest neighbor algorithms. We're working on GPU integration. This is really hard because the user level ecosystem is not really great. It's really hard to support GPUs on the diversity of uh, laptops that people have, and the libraries just keep changing. It's just not at the level of usability that we're used to. We're working on usability, things like data frame support, 
better model visualization, better model validation. These are things we, we invest in. It's actually a lot of work. <laughs> One thing that I've, I've, I've uh, gotten to realize lately is that there's a strong battle for the mind share of people. And so scikit-learn is not seen as exciting. What's exciting is deep learning, it's TensorFlow, it's PyTorch. The thing is that people love complexity. They just want big cars, they want big computers. But the reality behind this narrative is, is more complicated. If you do surveys and you look at the size of the data that most people process, most people process data that's on the order of magnitude of the gigabytes. And that's like the biggest data they process. We talk a lot about deep learning. My experience has been that on many problems, it's the wrong tool. Recently with a student, we did a fairly strong survey benchmarking uh, deep learning algorithms compared to, to tab, uh, tree-based uh, models on tabular data. So things like gradient boosting, random force. The paper was accepted at NeurIPS, which is kind of like the, well, one of the deep learning conferences. And it basically shows that tree-based models outperform deep learning. By the way, it's good that the community is willing to accept such papers. It's, it's a healthy community. So what, what I'm, I'm, I'm going to realize is that what we really have is a marketing sh uh, a shortcoming. And there's no surprise because their competitors investing so much money into flashy things. And we're just, you know, a community. <laughs> so we need to work on this. Not sure how. <laughs> there's one last gap that we need to, to address, which is that of data preparation. Data preparation is a bottleneck everywhere. And so we're starting a new project uh, that address things such as vectorizing uh, uh, complex uh, uh, data frames or assembling data across tables. It's going to be called Scrub, and I'm, I'm very excited about this. One thing that's really important is that we built all our development in scikit-learn, but in many other packages around examples. And so one thing that we did was to build a package that helps building documentations from examples. And I think this is important because by building this package and putting it out, we're kind of changing the norms, the way people do things. Okay, so some lesson learned in the broader Python ecosystem. I think a lot of the success was about making things accessible. One thing that I've really learned, and I've seen many times, is that communities can move mountains. We've seen excellent software just die because of lack of community. And okay software actually get fixed and become excellent because of communities. Communities require people skill. I really believe that unchecked complexity is a killer. And that's maybe the number one error I see done in, in, in uh, software. You need to find the trade-off and it's really hard. And a lot of things I didn't talk about, which are algorithmic and software engineering, which are absolutely crucial. I just chose not to talk about them. Okay, so we have open source. We're going to have a fantastic societal impact. We'll make a better world, right? Right. Well, the number one impact of machine learning has been online marketing. Now, all this money that helps big tech organize fancy conference and do great marketing is via ad money. And this ad money, I do not believe is doing great things. It's basically selling influence to the biggest bidder. And what we're really creating is mind control of the rich on the poor. And I really believe that this is true. One example, Cambridge Analytica used scikit-learn. We saw this by looking at their job postings. So we're not only creating the good. So we need to choose what we facilitate. I more recently chose to focus on health. I started by working on AI for brain images. That was really cool to get publications. 
One thing that was fascinating is that brain images are very, very rich data. However, they capture only a very small episode in the life of a patient. Even if I'm interested in something like a stroke, where brain imaging is crucial and stroke is a major health problem. If I'm, if I'm thinking of health, what I really should be doing is trying to prevent the stroke rather than trying to do data mining on the brain image. And here it's about thinking about health, the broader health, and not only medicine, not only you know the neurosurgeon who goes on TV, but rather all the work that's done on reducing tobacco usage, for instance, reducing alcohol usage, health prevention. So more recently, I've been uh, working on epidemiology and, and clinical uh, health records. Uh, what's really interesting here is that we can study real-life health outcome. We can focus on looking at individuals through a very long time and looking at the factors of their well-being. One thing I've learned is that we need to worry much, uh, about much more than, than prediction. Prediction is really good. Well, we're going to worry about interventions. What are the interventions that we can do to improve people? And that loops us into causality, and there's a link between the two, but I won't cover it. And one thing that I've learned is that one very important thing, maybe the most important thing, is to worry about better policy rather than automating things. Now, in terms of technology, this more recent focus has been interesting because it has guided the kind of in innovation I'm interested in. It's guiding the kind of choices I do uh, when I, I choose to focus on software. And it's revealing new challenges to me. For instance, causality. I knew about causality, but I didn't really care about it. These days, it's a, a strong aspect of my research. Now, even in healthcare, AI doesn't always do good. One of the dangers is that it can entrench inequalities. The way it does this is it captures the historically underserved populations and it just replicates this. For instance, in the US, black people are more often poor. That's probably true in Europe too. Poor people tend to commit more crime. Actually, they tend to commit more blue collar crime. The rich people commit white collar crime, but because we don't look at white, white collar crime, it's not in the database. Okay, so we have black crime. Very good. I can learn this, and then I can basically, uh, I can uh, not give bail to black people, which is something that has happened, by the way. Another thing that, that AI does everywhere is that it shifts the power balance. Basically, big tech is coming in every aspect of our life. And the medical doctors know this very well, and that's one of the reasons why they worry about AI. I've mentioned AI, but it's a broader problem. It's not only about AI, it's about automation. It's everywhere. It's a slow and deep transformation of our society and it shifts the power balance everywhere. Toll booths on highways. When I was a kid, they were manned by people. These days they're automatic. Is that a bad thing? Probably not, you know, we go faster through them, but those jobs have been lost. And if we don't do something for those jobs, we're creating more inequality. So, you know, this automation can free time, but if it, it will free time the right way, only if we adapt our social structure. Most of you are probably not working in AI or automation. Most of you are working on, on good things and good science. For instance, climate modeling. It's really important, right? We, we have global warming. Climate war modeling is really important. So better scientific knowledge will bring better progress. Well, we're seeing it's quite failing, right? The public discussion around global warming is a disaster. So the problem is everywhere. Social efforts are needed everywhere. We just can't build technology and hope things will happen. And, and I've gotten to worry a lot about what we call techno-solutionism. For every problem, somebody like me who likes to build things, especially software, is going to seek technological solutions. 
basically, I want to build shiny magic tools. I have the tool that's going to solve the problem. Oh, you have a problem, I'm going to build another tool. In health, for instance, I can build the automated doctor. In global warming, I worry about electric cars. It avoids addressing the people problems. And the behavior are almost always part of the equation. For health, there's a lot of behavior. It's just crucial. For global warming, it's quite clear. I, 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 I do believe we're going to need to change our behavior if we want to address the problem of global warming. For instance, academics fly too much. The thing is, tools are much easier to control than people. People are annoying. So we, you know, we can fix tools. When we do this, we're, we're using our humanism. It's, it's, it's in a way, it's back to democracy. It's back to accepting that people have a will, that they will contradict us, that they will disagree, and that if we can't convince them, we're failing. It's back to the lesson that, that Psychic Learn ta taught me. And one of the reasons this lesson is important is that, you know, I may be super sharp, but sometimes I'm wrong. And so if I don't enable people to tell me this, then I will create disasters. It's basically the history of dictators. So there's this notion of appropriate technology, which is a technology that's adapted to, you know, society. And I think the things we need to act upon are things like transparency and outreach, because we need to foster trust. We need to foster public understanding. Something that's recognized in ethics is the need for autonomy and appropriation. People should own their own decision, which means that we shouldn't build things that are too complicated for people that basically disempowers them. We can't disempower people in their health. We can't disempower people in every aspect of their life. And here, I'm a bit worried about big tech. And people need to understand what they manipulate because if they don't understand, then they have false opinions about them and we're in a democracy. And so if people have false opinions, then they vote wrong. So I personally like to invest my efforts in favoring lightweight tech. One thing that I noted when I was in Africa was that it seems that cell phones have had a much broader spread in Africa than cars. Cell phones are incredibly useful. So really, by creating the technology, we're governing who has access to it. So we need to navigate a trade-off between complexity and utility. And one of the problems that we have is that the th norms in our world are set by big tech. And so the values of big players define what's cool. And I think we need to act on the social norms of success. And that's what I'm doing right now. <laughs> okay, so you know, saving the world one line at a time, well, surprisingly, that didn't work out. <laughs> uh, one thing that we did do was uh, the scientific Python ecosystem, and this was a success, but it's not enough. And I think you know, the, the core aspects of this success was democratizing the technology and the community. I, I think we need to keep working on, on what I know there is sometimes called appropriate technology, and we need to choose how we innovate. And here, I'm convinced that we need to focus on good applications and lightweight solutions. And one thing that I'm realizing more and more is that a lot of the problems require social solutions. So they, it's crazy what you can do by inspiring people. If you inspire people, they help you, they go further. And in general, I think, you know, the history of science and technology tells us that to turn technological progress into societal progress, you need social action. It's true for global warming, you know, the, the work that's being done these days by the International Panel for uh, uh, Climate Change is just incredible. There's such a good work at social action. It's also true for turning productivity gains, free time, into good things, such as cool time, which is what happened in the last 200 years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gail, for that really inspiring talk, I think. Yeah, you, you've done what you were saying. You've inspired an entire room of people there. So let's go straight to Slido. We have about five minutes for Q&A. So uh, I'll start from the top. 
So we've seen several examples of well-known open source projects changing to a more restricted license, Docker, Elasticsearch, MongoDB, HashiCorp. Do you think there's something they could have done to obtain enough funding or contributions to remain fully open sourced and sustainable? The, the problem of sustainability in open source is a difficult one. I mean, that's maybe one of my biggest day-to-day -day work these days. Uh, however, you know, I, I think those actors are made of very well-paid people who've become rich, living in one of the most expensive areas of the world. Uh, I think there were other ways, yes. Thank you. Uh, so next question up is, uh, do you think that experience from managing a large team or small a set of contributors like you've done can be applied to smaller teams or are the dynamics different in each scenario? There are different dynamics, but there is a continuity. I think what I've, I've learned, I've learned a lot, honestly, in terms of people. Uh, I think what I've learned applies everywhere, you know, uh, especially in terms of communication, communication skills, in terms of decision making. Uh, I also think that you need to scale up progressively and things like breaking into sub teams, having formal governance, formal communication. These are things that you need to do later on in the project. You start with little structure, but if you stay with little structure, then you end up in what's known as the tyranny of the structureless. Thank you very much. Uh, so the next question, um, how do you see the dialogue between social science and computing developing? What are the language barriers like between those? That's like a whole talk in itself, which I would love to give. Uh, maybe I can say one thing. So yes, it's crucial. Maybe I can say one thing. It's even more than computing. It's about quantitative science. It's about, I mean, I was trained as an engineer, a physicist. I guess most of you were here. It takes a while to understand non-quantitative sciences. Uh, sciences were the construct, you know, intelligence is a construct. The constructs are hard to define. They're hard to measure. So it takes a long time. I also think that from the scientific perspective, it's absolutely fascinating. But the first thing we need to do is to understand the epistemology of this world. And it's fascinating. Thank you. So uh, next question. So you, you said partway through your talk that democracy is uh, more important than correctness. But if you as a contributor to a project feel really strongly about some technical uh, decision, um, and then the community disagrees with you. How do you maintain enthusiasm for that project when you think it's going in the wrong direction? And then what about if you're the maintainer of that project? How does that change? Well, if I think myself, and I look, uh, look at myself 20 years uh, ago, I probably would have left, slammed the door and insulted people. Uh, I guess these days I would stay. And you know, there's a question of maturity here. And one thing that we've learned quite early on is that we in, in scikit-learn and software projects cannot work with everyone. And that sometimes it's it's okay to accept a loss because the person just isn't enough in the dialogue. Thank you. So next up, open source has always said no discrimination against fields of endeavor, but do we need a class of license which does discriminate against unethical uses of code, things like Cambridge Analytica, generating, generating ad clicks, AI weapons? That's a really interesting question. I've always been uh, in favor of the standard open source definition, so not in favor of this. Uh, one, one of the people I look up to, Greg Wilson, uh, who, dot, who did software carpentry, for instance, wrote a blog post in favor of those classes of licenses. I actually don't believe in them because I believe that uh, people will do evil anyhow. So we have time for one more question. Um, how politically active do you think a developer can be in their work? How reasonable is it to begin turning down projects you don't feel are socially valuable or are detrimental? Grant funding is sort of precarious and volatile and seems to work against personal freedom for this. There's a lot in this question. That's great. Grant funding, I think there it's the role of the PIs. And I think, you know, and it's a trade-off. You know, you can you can try to go for easy success and 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 write the grants that you know will go through, or you can try to fight the battles that you think are the good ones, or ideally what you need to do is to take the middle ground, because if you fight battles and lose them, then you'll die. Uh, in terms of being politically active, there's another trade-off, which is you may make choices and not discuss them. I've done this for 20 years. I've been a closet activist for 20 years. These days, I'm realizing I need 
I, I need to broadcast a bit more of my choices. But that also comes with being better at communicating, being better at, at people skills. Uh, I I sometimes end up, you know, in, in panels and AI regulations or things like this. And then I realize I'm basically powerless because all the other people sitting on those panels are mostly lawyers paid by uh, lobbies, even though that's not their job title. They're much better than I am at communicating. And we're back to, you know, social problems solved by, by social solutions. I guess I need to get better at communicating. So in terms of, you know, politically active, you know, find your trade-off, be in your conference zone. But I would say, don't give up. Thank you so much, Gael. Thank you.